People forget that before baseball and football existed in this country, organized competitive shooting was the number one sport for this country. I'm we thinking go back to that. Time. It was 1876. They had the first Creed Moore match, and it was on the Creed Farm in upstate New York. All right, everybody. We know uh, this one's going to be a pretty exciting one because we have Nick Loffenberg and Ian Clem across the table from Mark and myself. And uh, when it comes to long range, competitive shooting, uh, in fact, too, I'll, I'll say precision shooting as well because we're going to talk about all different types of precision shooting competitions and uh, even the definition of what long range is or what constitutes that can can change. Uh, some of the things we'll probably bring up here are like precision rim fire and whatnot, in which case you're shooting extremely preci- precisely and, and require a great deal of precision, but the distances might not be as great as then when we're talking about ELR, extreme long range, and even that's a bit uh, up in the air as to what people think is is ELR. So, um, very excited about this. I think between you guys, we've got a lot of experience in the varying types of precision or long range competitions. Um, and so, yeah, let's just dive in on what all somebody could get into. Like, you're just, you know you want to shoot in a manner that's that takes a lot of forethought, some knowledge of ballistics, it takes some knowledge of how you know, projectiles fly through the air and, and the whole rifle set up, uh, but you're not sure what outlet you want to go about uh, exploring that in. So, Mark, you have, uh, as usual, some paper here. I've, I've You've got, got a list. Got a little printout, got a list. And, and yeah, I mean, Jim, I mean, long-range shooting, precision shooting is getting so popular. It's so hot right now. We always talk about that. It is. Uh, there's so many different disciplines a person can get into. Uh, and part of it is like, you know, where do you even, how do you even find out about these these different things? And hopefully you're finding out on the Vortex Nation podcast. But I mean, Ian and Nick, welcome. What a rare treat to have these two together, Jim. Uh, Ian, Absolutely. It's, it's just always, it's always fun having you on. And we don't, we don't get you enough. Thank we need you. you over here more. I appreciate so. it. I like this. <laughs> Maybe maybe we back up a step though, because I'd like to hear kind of how you guys got into long range shooting, and maybe that might sure. maybe that story might kind of help a person along their long range journey. Sure, yeah. Alphabetical order, I think, would put Ian first. Okay, so I started short range shooting uh, in the basement of a Catholic grade school. We would shoot uh, twenty two long rifle small bore. It's called fifty feet, I think. Indoors. A lot of people get their start that way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Church basement, <laughs> rimfire shooting. Well, it was a uh, father-son league for the wintertime. So what else are you going to do weeknights in Wisconsin in the winter? You're going to shoot um, down in the grade school. Um, <laughs> so it was it was, it was was great. It was that's sort of how I cut my teeth on the whole competition thing. It was fun. Um, took score, you know, tried to beat our dads. It was, it was a good deal. And then... Then I remember, even before I could drive, I would ride my bike down to our local bookstore in the small town I grew up in, and they had a magazine rack, and at the very far corner of the magazine rack was like hand loader magazine, rifle magazine, and something called Varmint Hunter magazine. Oh, yeah. And I picked up the Varmint Hunter, and I was like, what? These guys are shooting prairie dogs at 300 yards, 400 yards, so I saved up all my... You know, uh, construction money and bought a uh, 22250. I bought a, a Ruger number one falling block single shot 22250. That's a classy gun. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I have this cross dominance left eye, right hand, and it was a single shot with a top tang safety, so it was kind of ambidextrous. And um, dad had a number one, so I sort of romanticized them a little bit. But I wanted to be one of these guys in the magazines that would go out to South Dakota and set up you know, with a bipod and, and, uh, I think I had like an 18 power scope, which was more power than anyone in my town had, you know, it was yeah. like a huge, huge scope. Um, and so learned how to hand load for it and shooting little 40 grain nozzle ballistic tips at almost 4,000 feet per second with this 22250, And, um, and had a blast. We, uh, we called them our cowboy trips. Dad would drive me and like two of my buddies from high school. And we each had one of these kind of varmint rifles either a 223 or 22 250 one guy had a 220 swift it was kind of neat and we would uh practice like finding a prairie dog that far away trying to see okay what's the wind doing you know and we'd spot for each other and had a really really good time because 
before then, I think the longest shot I ever taken was maybe 150 yards uh, at a crow back home here. Um, so that was big country, big sky, and long range. And it came home, you know, with stories to tell your friends, and and you were a hero for for shooting this prairie dog at 400 <laughs> yards. So that was my introduction into real what I consider to be long range, like shooting further than what you were comfortable with or or had to that point. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you were shooting prairie dogs with a Ruger number one before you could even drive. Yeah, and, and hand loading your own ammunition. It was man. It was, it was, it was a neat way feel, to grow up. That makes me feel like I wasted my first sixteen <laughs> years. I don't, even know, I, I don't think I could do anything. I could try <laughs> anything cool, at least. Uh, that's awesome. What about? I mean, like back back then, uh, which I can uh, range finders. I mean, did you guys even no, have range finders? There yeah. was no one. No one heard of range finders before. We had like the old school mill dot reticles with like the, mm-hmm. the football shaped mill dots. Um, adjustable objective parallaxes, and and if we knew how to use them, you know, good luck. You know, we'd put it at whatever number looked cool and start shooting. Oh yeah. Um, but it was very very crude. But it was sort of that that golden period of ignorance is bliss, where you don't really know that much, but you're still having a ball. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sometimes you wish you could go back there. <laughs> um, but no, it was it was uh, it was a lot of fun, and then it was sort of. It was sort of like someone pushed you over this this hill where you just started picking up speed. You came back home and you're like, "Well, how can I how can I do this here in Wisconsin? Are there any um, you know ranges in the area?" And then you start hearing about, "Well, there's a 600 yard range in Eau Claire if you you know if you drive up there." And um, and it was it was there was a lot to follow, but that was sort of like the the thing that got me going. Um, and then, well, can I apply this to big game hunting too? You know, if I get good at shooting these little things then I can shoot something bigger, easier. So nice. Anyway. That's awesome. You know, you touched on, I don't, don't want to get too deep here, but you touched on something that I think in some ways like helps define long range in a way. It's like challenging yourself, challenging kind of your, your personal uh, effective range and challenging your comfort zone. And then ex- like your limit is your limit. You know, mm-hmm. and then as you get better, you can shoot further, more accurately, more precisely. So um, I think oftentimes we think like, oh, I have to be able to shoot like this far or that far. It's like, no, it's like, wh- where are you at? Yeah. You know, and then cha- and then to challenge yourself. Very incremental goals and gains along the way. Um, you set like a new standard for yourself where now I'm satisfied with this level of precision see if I can't ratchet that down a little more by exploring some of these other things that I haven't been doing yet. And then now you have a new set of standards for yourself and set a new goal according Mm -hmm. to those. Yeah. All right. Awesome. How about you, Nick? Um, I grew up uh, always being in the outdoors, hunting, fishing. Uh, My dad was an outdoorsman as well. Um, He's a very talented archer. Um, He's competed in the world uh, competition, I think, four years uh, he's so he's he's very good, and I always wanted to shoot with him. So I got into shooting bows, and uh, I was pretty good in the competition area. And um, I turned twelve, and it became time for me to go hunting. And um, I had buck fever, worse than I've ever experienced, like any type of nervousness in my life. I couldn't hardly stand in my tree stand; like I was just shaking so much. Um, I wounded a couple of animals that year and it completely turned me off hunting with a bow. Um, it just, Mm -hmm. I don't know what it was, but that, like I just said, nope, if I'm going to hunt, I'm going to do it in an ethical way. I'm not going to wound animals. Um, I would always been pretty good with a rifle. So I decided to kind of put all my eggs in that basket and okay, I'm going to be a very competent rifle hunter. So I started shooting rifles a lot. I bought my first long range gun which was actually a 243 uh not a 243 223 actually it was a savage um uh it was their um model 10 police sniper rifle in their uh oh. show stock yes yeah yeah that thing was pretty badass good. um good choice and i did a lot of work with that uh I, I learned how to shoot kind of with that um i started wanting to push things further i eventually sold that gun um, got a 308 because 
everybody knows you can't be a sniper unless you have a 308, right? Correct. <laughs> so mm-hmm. um, so, so I, I got the because that was a quintessential long range cartridge in my head, right? Um, so I got the 308, which I think a lot of people do start off that way, which I, I'm really happy I did because I put a tremendous amount of rounds on there. I didn't think you could burn out a 308. I successfully did it. Uh, I think I probably had somewhere around 7,000 rounds on that rifle. And um, uh, so I did, uh, got into long range shooting that way. And I always want to push that envelope a little bit further, a little bit further. Uh, started hand loading, um, had a family friend teach me how to hand load when I was in my early 20s. Um, kind of continue to expound upon that, learning new techniques, better equipment. Um, and then uh, kind of got on the competition side of things when I started with Vortex. My first year at Vortex, I, I was working here for just a little bit over a year before my first match. Mm-hmm. And uh, I fell in love with competition long-range shooting. I feel like, I mean, yeah, when it comes to competition, sort of anything, whatever hobby you're into, it's you can you can sort of doink around and just have fun with it and, you know, plink or just recreationally do it. But, but there's always going to be people who decide, yeah, it's not enough. I've determined this is definitely my thing. I don't really want to have another thing, or maybe, maybe this will be the biggest thing that I have. And so I've got to find a way that usually, usually when you get into competition, you're, you're able to go to places and areas that maybe been closed off just to that competition. So you can do stuff that's more exciting bigger, better, compete against people that are maybe better and, and stuff like that, and you can really test yourself. So I've, that's kind of that logical next step for somebody. Um, to Mark's point earlier, he brought up, you know, what what is long-range shooting, and that is you know, what's long-range for you. I remember when I got that 308, uh, when I started, we got a just an 8-inch plate that has been beat to hell now, but it's still ticking. Um when I was able to hit that eight inch plate at 300 yards, I was just like enamored, just could not believe the fact that I hit that. Like that was long range shooting so far. Yeah, I know. Right. And that, I mean, that's a chip shot now. Right. But that, at that time I was tickled to death. And, um, I mean, by the time I, before I start or started working for vortex, I had increased my point to, um, I was able to take that same 308 out to 1,350 yards. We had a gong out of my parents' house, and it was a 20-inch plate. So, I mean, it was under two minutes, and it was, you know, way past transonic for that 308. I mean, it was, you know, 2,600 feet per second gun shooting a 175 grain bullet. You know? That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah it changes. Um, so getting into the, the competition side of things, you know, the thing we wanted to really go over today is, all right, you've determined maybe that, that you enjoy this lifestyle a lot. You want to make it a sport. You want to really push yourself in it. What are all the different avenues that you can do that? And what's kind of the differences between them? What's the unique attributes to them? I think also the fact that there are so many different forms of precision slash long range shooting competition just shows that you know, there's so many different kinds of guns that you can get. There's so many different kinds of uh, ways that you can shoot, places that you can shoot. Um, but I mean, where's the where's the first logical place to start? Would it be uh, with something like? I mean, in my head, I'm thinking start with, uh, and this isn't necessarily what somebody should start with, but where our conversation should start. Um, maybe like the Precision 22 stuff, because that seems like the easiest mm-hmm. to just go and do yeah yeah I absolutely think, and that's what i was thinking as well jim you almost break it down you have your rim fire and your center fire yeah yeah so precision rim fire now if you're not familiar with that yet at this point you may be scratching your head because you're thinking like somebody somebody actually wants to go out and shoot in a precision manner with my old 1022 the answer is yeah mm-hmm. uh that is pretty much it but uh Nick, I know you do you've done some of this. Mm-hmm. Have you yet? Okay. Yeah. Um I know you know a lot about it, but uh what's what's the whole deal there? Is it pretty much you can take any old twenty two out and Yeah, for the most part. I mean if it just as far as getting into it, I mean the always that first step is always the hardest. Um so if you have a twenty two, you don't need to go worry about, you know, spending thousands of dollars on a brand new twenty two and getting a new scope for it. Um if you just take what you got and go try it. Uh it's the quickest way to also figure out what you need to change about your equipment. You know, mm-hmm. um, you might find that, okay, well maybe my gun does need to be a little bit heavier or, okay, this, you know, 
four power scope just isn't cutting it. Um, or these cap turrets just aren't cutting it. Yeah. So being able to get an idea of what you want to do from that, just by at least jumping in at some point. Um, there's also different types of 22 disciplines. I know we're probably referring right now to like NRL 22 or 22 X. Uh, but there are, there's a lot of precision sports that don't even use scopes. Um, mm. so iron sights, you know, so that's another thing. Uh, so there's a lot of different types of 22 disciplines as Ooh. well. Yeah, actually, the uh, <laughs> the Rimfire F class national championship is going on right now. Um, Wait, there's Rimfire F class? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh um, shoot, I didn't even know that. I didn't yep. know it either. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's just like regular F class. Uh, I'll talk about what that is, I guess. Um, but it's uh, just with a 22. So same deal, prone, slow fire. Um, I think the course of fire for this week is. Uh, I don't know why it's something to do with tradition, but uh, they shoot 50 yards, 100 yards, and then 50 meters. I don't know why they have to shoot 50 meters and 50 yards, but that's that's what they do. Um, but, yep, scoring target, you know, V-bowl or X-ring, um, and then 10-9 and so on. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot to be said for uh, not spending your weekend loading 500 rounds of centerfire ammunition, yeah. you know, just grabbing your 22 and some ammo. And go on and competing. Um, I see myself. I see myself doing that at some point in the future. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you talk, I mean, everybody's busy, right? But you got a family. Like, I love to shoot. Like, you know, I want to d- compete here, but then ah, if I want to be competitive, maybe I'd need to be reloading. I don't have the time re- to reload. I mean, yeah, just being able to buy some quality twenty-two ammo. And yeah. Go. I mean, right. that's that's a big. Mm-hmm variable you've kind of removed yeah mm-hmm. and uh our buddies at capstone precision they own uh lapua and, and sk and and vitivori and burger they've got uh two different stations across the country one in ohio one in mesa you send your 22 rifle to them right they take it out of the stock and put it in a special fixture and then they've got umpteen different lots of like some of the best ammunition you can buy they happen to sell but they'll test all those lots through your specific rifle in an indoor tunnel Mm-hmm. And they chart out all the um, relative group sizes, velocities, standard deviations, but basically send it through an algorithm to say this specific lot is optimized or tuned for your barreled action. How much of it would you like to buy? And yeah. if you lay into a certain stock of it, uh, that ammo, you know, that service that they've just provided, I think is is uh, don't quote me on this, but I think it's included in that in that deal. Oh wow! So it's a really really cost effective way because otherwise, I mean, you've done this, I've done this. We mm. go to the our our local store and we try to buy twelve different types of rim for ammo to see, okay, which what one does shoots. my rifle like? Mm, you know, yeah. You know, find the one you like and then you go hopefully they have a, a bunch lot. of it <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> and then yeah. it, and that yeah. might not be any good anymore yeah. Yeah. Wait, i mean what you guys are bringing up too is is what blows my mind about the rimfire competition stuff and really just the rimfire world in general which is that it's always been i think when we talked in our rimfire podcast with uh seth and ryan you know like like shooting these little tiny calibers and stuff like that has always been it, it kind of came out of this uh like history of people wanting to play games right like oh, it yeah. was it was sort mm-hmm. of almost like this uh sort of goof around type thing pastime and now what you have is then people took it more and more seriously and of course anytime you introduce some sort of fun everybody has to like compete to see who can have the <laughs> most fun at it and uh, inevitably that means beating everyone else at some random thing you made up um but you can take the rimfire thing as far as you want i mean you can have there's like a Ruger 1022 or something like that that you can just buy off the shelf. You know, every it seems like every major manufacturer has some basic rimfire. And then there's so many people nowadays that, I mean, there's plenty of them in our office here that have rimfire rifles that look and feel exactly like a full-on centerfire competition, 20-plus pound rifle, all that stuff. But it shoots little twenty two. You know, I mean, and, and everything matches their competition gun. They got a Razor Gen 2 on it that's like a $2,000 <laughs> scope, and they've got a chassis in it that's like a $1,500 chassis or something like that. I mean, all this stuff, and it adds up. And they're like all in on shooting this little tiny kind of just like game cartridges in and some what's ways. What's comical to me is like even the magazines are like full length, full size magazines, and yeah. they've got this little tiny yeah. like 22 <laughs> sections sticking out right. in front. Yeah. But I guess if it's if it helps you go through the 
through it, the manual of arms. I do actually. So that's one thing I really love about using a 22 as a trainer. I know a lot of people are kind of against using 22 as a trainer. Um, one of the things I like about the most is that, for one, I, I can actually do live fire without, you know, I'm, I'm not not just dry firing. One of the things you lose from dry firing is that even though you're building that muscle memory, you are also not able to see what's happening downrange. Mm-hmm. Um, with a 22, you can see mistakes in your process and your fundamentals. It, it's glaringly obvious when you're doing something wrong. If you have a 22 that shoots really good and you're pulling the trigger and you're shooting off of a barricade or a structure or something like that, and I mean, you'll see your shot stringing one way, left, right, up, down, whatever it is, and you'll be able to identify pretty quick, okay, there's something wrong with my trigger pull, there's something wrong with my breathing, you know, whatever it is. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I really like a 22 as a trainer, um, and I do use it that way a lot, and that's the reason why my 22 is in a $1,400 action and a $1,200 <laughs> chassis, <laughs> and it weighs 20 pounds, you know, because yeah. it's, it's made to mimic my competition rifle. Yeah. I was some famous gun raider that had a quote that said something like, uh, "You can you can tell the seriousness of a rifleman by uh, how serious their twenty two is, or something right. like that." <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, now, about how far in a general? Let's go back, like you were saying, like a NRL twenty two or NRL twenty two X or something like that competition. How far might one be shooting with one of these twenty twos? Like, what are they even capable of? Most people don't think of them as being more than a 50 yard gun right yeah most people wouldn't think that um I, c- I can tell you what i've done with mine personally i think in most like nrl 22 x matches they might top off somewhere around 400 yards it may go Oof. up further um nrl 22 is is listed into a 100 yard range so 100 yards is the furthest shot okay gotcha um i've taken my 22 out to 500 once i started passing 500 then i started losing any type of um, reliability in my point of impact. I mean, I knew what my drop was. I knew where it averaged, I'm up, but I might be hitting a mil high, mil low, you know, and then hit the target and the mil high, mil low, hit the target. Hmm. Um, and I so, can see that that's not necessarily you. That's just kind of the unpredictability of what's happening to the bullet at that distance. Well, at that range, your your muzzle velocity has dropped off so far right. that, I mean, a change in a you know, a couple of yards would be a dramatic change in your point of impact. Right. So, um, having, I mean, I would, I'd love actually to look up what my remaining velocity is at 500 yards, but it ain't much. <laughs> if you're starting out with standard velocity, like 10, 50 or so at the muzzle. Yeah. If I was like, I'm shooting all subsonics. Oh yeah. You're going to be like 250 feet per second yeah, or something. Damn, I don't think the it. bullet's stable anymore <laughs> no. at that distance. Mm-hmm. And people do go out further. I think the, the record right now, um, that was set is like 520. We I mean, should point out too people that we've gone further, but it's not been like uh, like you have to hit it, and so many and target size has to be so big, and you can only take so many shots. Like that record's like five hundred twenty yards. I think people have gone out past a thousand and actually hit things that. But mm-hmm. whether or not you call that probably was a slingshot at that, at that point, right? <laughs> at that point, you just get somebody downrange to sort of like catch it, yeah. right? <laughs> like, oh yeah, got it. Um, <laughs> What I was, what I was going to say there, we uh, if anybody's interested, we did do a podcast on NRL 22, 22X, if you want to look back at that. Mm-hmm. Check that out. We should move on to our next uh, our next one. What would, uh, how did, What's the order of your list here, Mark? Do you oh, go to PRS next and all that sort of no thing? No particular okay. order. Well, I'd like to hear... Let's go to one of the most popular ones out there, yeah. PRS. Um, Precision Rifle Series. So PRS isn't really like... It's kind of... A type of shooting happens within PRS, right? Yeah, so PRS, that particular name, Precision Rifle Series, is a- a- actually an organization. Kind of like NFL or NBA. Or, yeah, okay. and then there's also the National Rifle League. Those two organizations have basically the same type of shooting going on. Right. Um, just two larger organizations within the United States, governing bodies, kind of. Okay, got it. Now, how does that type of competition work? If somebody showed up to one of these matches... Uh, what would they be seeing there? So this is this is probably where if somebody wanted to get into precision rifle and didn't know what direction to go, this would be one of those kind of definers. So PRS, NRL, those are considered to be action shooting sports. So like three gun is an action shooting sport. Um, and that is because it is more of the, you get up and run with your gun, move, get to position, position, you, you're changing things up. Um, so it falls under that class. And so if you want to do precision rifle, but you're not 
like a lot of guys that are getting into it later in life, you know, maybe they don't have good hips or anything like that. They, they can't get out of positions quickly. It might be harder for them to do that type of sport. Okay. So, um, but in that type of competition, a lot of people talk to, call them like a tactical field match where you're, um, you take a precision rifle. In fact, I think a lot of precision rifles used in PRS and NRL mimic uh, F-class rifles in a lot of ways. I mean, people are even putting tuners on their barrels, for, I mean, which I, I've really only seen in F-class before. But Yeah, the technology seems to like kind of trickle down, like it might get generated in the benchrest world even, and then it'll be a few years and the F-class guys will start looking over there and oh that's working for them i'm gonna try yeah. that and then it sort of trickles to the to the right. precision stuff and and we I, I think everybody is just we're always looking for that next level up you know yeah. maybe a a gun that shoots a half minute just isn't good enough i mean and it, and that's a lot of that psychological but mm-hmm. it's all about de- increasing your percentage of hitting a small target um, so if I can have my gun consistently shooting a half minute that might be fine for me but the next guy he he feels like he needs to be consistently shooting a quarter minute. Well, if you're consistently shooting a quarter minute, that gun, for one, is probably a hell of a nice rifle. But on top of that, you know, something like a tuner can always put that back in, you know, as you have throat erosion, as your, you know, seating depth becomes more uh, crucial. You can go back in and, and go ahead and retune your rifle when you get to the match, bring those groups back in and, and go out and shoot. Yeah. The thing, uh, the thing I like about, these types of matches um, and this type of competition, at least this is the way it works out in my head, is that you've got, um, and, and we've mentioned it a couple times now, like F-Class and Benchrest and stuff like that. Those ones are where somebody's just really putting so much forethought and so much uh, intentionality and work into a lot of things that happened before even the shot. And obviously, you know, they have to take the shot just right, and there's a lot of marksmanship aspects that happen to that, reading wind, whatnot. But there's there's so much that happens up to that, and and I know my personality personally uh, is one such that I can't put all my attention on one thing for like a super long time or really keep it there uh, because it's easily distracted and all that stuff. The the nice thing about what we're discussing here with PRS NRL these uh, more action shooting precision matches is. You kind of have to be a little bit of a jack of all trades, and you have to allow yourself to make compromises in some areas because you're on the clock. You know, there's a certain time limit you have to make all your shots within, and you're shooting from uncomfortable positions, and you're you're doing a lot of different things at once. You're trying to move, and you're trying to strategize over: Am I going to go over here first, or am I going over there first, or? You know, how do I, I just have to even remember the order? I was going to say remember the order of the targets. Of operations. And so you kind of have to allow yourself to make more compromises and your mind right. has to switch gears a lot, which I just for somebody who's maybe slightly ADD, it, like <laughs> it uh, it satisfies that uh, that bit of just always scattered brainness. <laughs> you love chaos. Jim. I, I do. Um, but that's that's what's pretty fun about it. Like you, you have to know about wind. You have to know about ballistics. You got to know the fundamentals you got to know all that stuff but then you know what hits the fan and the whole thing's going and you're on the clock and something goes wrong or it changes and you have to adapt on the fly and it's just i mean that's where the action shooting like you mm-hmm. said kind of comes into play well you're applying all those same fundamentals like the fundamentals don't change but your position changes or the barricade changes or the whatever you're shooting off changes some very very unique scenarios from what I've seen yeah. and it's being able to I guess apply all those fundamentals or be mm-hmm. able to read that situation um, there's a lot going on it's challenging yeah even yeah. from an outsider looking in like I've never done PRS but when I when I see some of the match reports from Nick and and just sort of follow along as a fan of of competitive shooting Tony will come home and tell me about mm-hmm. matches he's shot what seems attractive to me is is the problem solving. Like mm-hmm. you are presented with this unique uh, scenario, and maybe you have five minutes, ten minutes. I don't know what's typical in terms of like um, planning time or, or strategy time. Sometimes you don't even know until you get there. Yeah, a lot of it is. I mean, sometimes you have blind stages, so you okay. walk up there and you cannot see what you're going to do. The RO will read the stage to you, and you're going to go do it. Yeah, so like if you pride yourself on being able to adapt and like making a good thing out of sort of a uh, challenging situation, that sounds like Mm -hmm. a lot of fun. Yeah. 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 That and the other thing that I'll just throw out there, there's something about 
action shooting sports that just kind of makes you feel a bit like a badass. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's just you know, like you don't think F class shooters with our elbow pads and our spectacles and Look, monocles laying down are badass. I think What's these guys are that? badass in a very yeah, very unique <laughs> way. All right, it, it, it's un, it's undoubted. I mean, you can't you can't deny the fact that what you guys do is pretty badass in terms of, even if you just look at our episode numbers, the F class episode that we did uh, with you guys was one of our top episodes because everybody's so curious about it. They all want to know what, what actually takes to shoot that precisely at such long ranges. But I mean, if you look back to when you're a kid and you're playing toy guns with your buddies or whatever, everybody's always running around, hiding behind stuff and, you know, like pretending to, you know, you shoot like rubber bands or BB guns or something off of like a rock at something. I mean, everything that you ever fantasize about, at least me, when I was a kid with my BB gun in the backyard, was like, I'll run over here and hide behind (laughs) this and try and shoot that thing. And then I'm going to run over here and hide behind that and try and, I mean, it's just sort of like what I just naturally did. And then all of a sudden you become a grown up, the gun gets bigger, the distances get further and the obstacles become like a bunch of welded together pipes or like rocks and or rooftops and all this stuff. It's right. it's crazy. But yeah, the monocle I, stays the same. The, the, <laughs> we should actually, yeah. Man, the monocle <laughs> might be. Uh, don't get the don't get the flex the uh, barrel rolling skills in uh, in F class too often. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, um, but that's probably that might be a good segue though because F class like a different set of challenges, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's an international form of competitive shooting. So it's governed by this thing called ICFRA. Let's see if I can get it. International Confederation Full Bore Rifle Association. So full bore is sort of like the uh, global term for uh, what we call high power in this country. So ICFRA is made up of all the different countries' respective NRAs as like a consortium. We're talking like 25 countries now, everyone from Germany, Japan, South Africa, um, Italy, Ukraine, you name it. Um, And so it's sort of this, it's a timed type of competition, but it's nowhere near like this. You have maybe 25 minutes for 20 record shots and maybe two ciders. So it's like the... It's like the chess of um, long-range competitive shooting. So if you're the type of guy who wants to, or gal who wants to focus um, and really concentrate on making the perfect shot, and you care not about whether or not you hit the target or miss the target, but how close to the center of the target did you hit? Yeah. That's sort of the F-class thing. But you, You guys don't even think about missing, really. I mean, you shouldn't miss. Like, that's definitely part of it, but like, yeah, as you as you sort of like progress throughout your your F class uh, career or whatever, you start to get disappointed by you know s- slight mistakes that put you just outside of the next scoring ring, you know. <laughs> um, but like we said before, it's all relative. So you know you're sort of ratcheting that that standard that you have for your own potential to be precise. But then when you're on the weekend with your high school buddies plinking with your 22s, it sort of translates and all those things that you learned from that discipline kind of go towards the informal, just mm-hmm. fun shooting. Yeah. Um, so it's a good a good landscape to sort of hone those really fine wind reading skills and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. And then you can sort of take that and apply it to hunting or if you want to try a different um, competitive shooting sport. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you have you have a time constraint. It's all pro- like you're pretty much in the same position every time you shoot. Correct? Yeah. So you're yep. you're prone, and in fact, your rifle is supported in the front and the back. So there's really no air. I mean, by the time you you start becoming competitive, everyone is a really good trigger puller, mm-hmm. and so that part of it you sort of take for granted. Breathing pulse fundamentals is all in the background and then the game is just who can make consistently better decisions than everyone else Mm -hmm. so decisions on when to shoot when not to shoot uh what tempo to shoot at if you've got a favorable condition and then the biggest one is just what is the wind doing and the light at that specific time that i'm about to pull the trigger and then compensating for that Mm -hmm. And if I can ask this real quick too, before we go in a little bit further on that, but you guys are primarily shooting three oh eights, 
So there's and two big divisions within F class, and there's something called F Open and F T R. Okay. And T R is target rifle, and for some reason they said, you know what, we should just have a limited class, so that it's a bit more like stock car racing. Everyone's on equal playing uh, ground, equal footing. So we'll make that 308s and 223s. Right. No one really shoots a 223. They I just all shoot so. 308s. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes they do well at at 600 yards with the big heavy 90 grainers, but everyone really shoots a 308. And then the open, which is anything 35 caliber and less. So the things that are dominating right now, 300 Wisdom, I know, I know 300 it. Arsom, um, uh, 7mm Wisdom, um, 284. Those are the, like the, the four big ones for the okay. open class. And that is you get a little bit extra weight that you can work with. You get to shoot off a front rest instead of a bipod. So I, I like the 308 uh, FTR division. So it's bipod, a little less weight to work with, a little bit more realistic rifle, practical rifle. In fact, my rifle um, probably weighs quite a bit less than than Nick's rifle. Oh, okay. Um, so, um, but yeah, it's it's a kind of a marathon. I'll be shooting nationals in two weeks down at Camp Atterbury, Indiana. So it'll be real swampy, you know, uh, high humidity, um, lots of mirage. But you're shooting for four days, and you're shooting about 100 rounds a day. Mm. So you have to keep hydrated, keep your vision up. You know, it's uh, it's not like – I don't think of it as an athletic type thing, but it's more of like a mental – who can stay mentally sharp for that long, for that many shots. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's like a marathon – like yeah. uh, like a mental marathon. Mm-hmm. I mean – and. Like we were getting at before too, it's it's not that there's you know when we were talking about uh, PRS NRL shooting, there's so much happening. There's still a lot happening in F class, but it, a lot of it is up to you know the the brain, less physicality. Yep. They've taken out that aspect of it in order to completely focus on on just the accuracy element. Yep. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean the, the level of detail that I hear F class shooters thinking in is is baffling to me. I mean, the fact that, I mean, you have mentioned, obviously there's the wind, but then you're thinking about light. You're mm-hmm. thinking about, um, I mean, so many people, how many people go to the range now and they, they get to the range, they set their stuff down. They're like, yeah, the wind's moving right to left. And then for the rest of the range day, the next hour or two or three, they're like, they just expect a right to left wind. Yeah. Whereas you guys, I mean, you have 20, 25 minutes to shoot or so you're waiting for gusts to happen and you're watching it if you're on the far left side of the field you're looking over at the far right side of the field to see if the grass is starting to blow over there because then you know it's eventually going to come over to you and all this i mean it's yeah that's just that's just wind and then you also have your i mean your ballistics your barrel tuning i'm, I'm curious about all this you're mentioning like cadence if you have a fair, favorable wind i'm sure cadence has something to do with Barrel harmonics, how often you're shooting or something. I'm so we just we just invented a new format, and it was sort of experimental this year. But um, we did a point series, sort of like PRS or NRL, and we tracked everyone's performance throughout the country, just the U.S., um, and then invited the top 32 FTR and the top 32 open to this finale that we called the V squared finale. So it was Vortex and a partner sponsor, Vitavori uh, Powders. Mm. So V-squared finale, and we set it up as an NCAA double elimination bracket. And so we had a camera facing downrange, so you could see the flags that the two competitors were um, looking at in the Mirage, and then a camera facing the two competitors right in the center. And basically it was like me and Jimmy facing off on the same target, alternating shots left and right, it's sort of like a chess match, you know, where like they make a move and you hit the timer and you make a move and you hit the timer. So yeah. it was like that. And it came down to the wire with sudden death shoot offs in like more than half of the cases. But it was so fun because usually you have that 25 minutes to use as you will. And you can just sort of sit on your thumbs and wait for hopefully the wind to die down and, and sort of make hay. Then you couldn't do that with this format. You had 45 seconds after your partner had shot, your competitor had shot, then it was your turn. So you had to make an honest win call, and maybe the win got stronger, but you didn't matter. You had to you had to make an honest win call during that forty five seconds, or else you you got scored a miss. That's called full bore shooting. It's what a lot of the rest of the world does, and we wanted to promote the U S. getting better at wind reading. So let's make an exciting format that's a double elimination. Mono we mono, no alibis for, hey, you got a good target puller, I got a bad one, or you got to shoot in the easy wind, I had to shoot in the hard wind. 
shot at the same time, same target. Mm, and okay. it was a it was a really big success. I think it's going to take off, and that's going to be. And the cool thing is, you can have a bunch of videos after the fact in the weeks later, like inviting former champions to almost um, commentate on the match. And so for beginners, they can watch those videos and say, well, what is he watching? How is he making this wind read? And you've got the John Madden, you know, pen on the target, and you can say, you know, okay, I think he's holding here. Let's see what happens. And Oh, that's cool. Yeah, cause and effect sort of uh, training. Yeah. I like that. That's a that, that's some that sounds uh, exciting. Adding a little bit of excitement. Yeah, yeah. and so we're going to uh, work on the software for next year, and hopefully it'll be real-time um, plotting. So in Scandinavian countries over in Europe, this is a spectator sport. They have they have stands of fans that are rooting for competitors for their for their country. Gosh, life is so interesting over there. I know, <laughs> I know. So I want to cop that and 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 do that here to where um, you can see real time, like anywhere in the world. They would just log on to this site and they could watch a competition happen in front of them with these e targets. Mm -hmm. That's cool. That's yeah. you know that's the funny thing about international shooting competitions is that internationally they have probably i mean just about everywhere you go you're gonna have far stricter gun laws than we have here in the united states but shooting sports are like giant spectator sports yeah. and everybody's into it super like stoked about it all the time like yeah everybody wants to do it so maybe we just like do we get a little lazy here sometimes take it for granted we're like yeah yeah and shooting and shoot anywhere you know <laughs> people forget that before baseball and football existed in this country organized competitive shooting was the number one sport for this country <sighs> i'm we thinking go back to that time. it was 1876 they had the first creedmoor match and it was on the creed farm in upstate new york and Men and women donned their best clothes and they had sun parasols and they were watching with, with telescopes and there was concessions and, and uh, a band would play and like it was a big national sport. Gotta get back to that. Yep. Right. <laughs> You're My talking goodness. me into it now. Um, you had me at parasols. I, <laughs> I, I think that uh, that format of F class actually is, appeals to me more. I like that you have that shorter window. Mm. And you have to make that a little bit more on the fly wind call, more practical, rather than wait for your strategy. Win. Yep. Yeah, yep. I like that. In the We're, in the one, it almost seems like even though you're competing against other people, like you're competing against yourself oh, in a lot of ways so. and this is like definitely like mono e mono it's or almost like off. watching it'd be like watching um like golf or even tennis in a yeah. way you yeah. know yeah. yeah um now we're getting a bit more a uh, talk being that we've gone now to f class and there's a few others that we're going to get into here as well we're getting into ones that are a, a tad more niche if you will um the previous ones we mentioned, like your uh, 22 Precision stuff, your PRS, NRL, I've seen people show up to those with what they have, right? You've got the 10-22 Ruger. You've got, uh, I've seen plenty of people already, and I know I'll, I'll speak to myself, show up with a Ruger American and 6.5 Creedmoor to a PRS match. Cool. You can do it. Maybe even if you just toss a different stock on it, whatever. F-Class, uh, There's what do you like think? There's like a couple commercial offerings that are legitimately competitive One, but you're not really necessarily just going to show up with your hunting rifle that's in like no yeah. and and it's more because you need time you need time you need rounds down range it's like uh you ask a professional uh, basketball player how did you know how hard to shoot that basket from that specific spot in the court it's because they've probably shot from that specific spot thousands of times and everywhere else thousands of times and they mm. program their computer and they know exactly you know how to do it it's more instinctive f class is sort of like that where um you know you think that there should be some pocket calculator you can we can whip out and you know come up with the exact formula and to hit the center every time but it's it's more experiential than that um so the rifle might be competitive but that's only half this the the, the equation okay yeah are you guys allowed to use like uh, wind meters, like kestrels, while you're shooting? No, no electronic devices at all, okay. um, except hmm. for a timer. You can use a timer. So. Oh, okay. Just to know, like. Yep. Yeah. Like, my session has begun. Yep. Okay. And you're not do like, you're not doing as much I at a PRS match. You may shoot uh, one stage. Might be okay. I'm gonna shoot at 300. Then I'm gonna go to 600. Then I'm gonna go to 900. Then I'm gonna go to 1100. 
in F class, there's pretty much like one target, right? That you're just going to be shooting at and trying to hit as close to the center as many times as Yes, as for, possible. for any one match. Now, um, the day might include an 800-yard match, a 900-yard match, and a 1,000-yard match. Okay. Mm-hmm. But you're like adding you know, four minutes of angle between yardages as you right. march back throughout the day. It's not like you're transitioning between different distances for mm-hmm. the same right. shooting session. So, But you've probably used an electronic device prior to stepping up to the line and stuff, right, to figure out what at least you need to dial. Yeah. But yeah. the nice thing is that then you're not, like, going to shoot once, dial, shoot again, sh- you know, dial again, and yeah. do all that. It's pretty... Set that, and then it's just on you to I have a the question shots. for you. Yeah. Um, is it safe to say, and excuse my ignorance, but do you basically have to hand load to shoot F-class? I mean, does anybody not hand load? Um, there are a few people that um, I think are sponsored by... Um, burger that uh, burger has basically a line of ammunition that's ready to go compete with it uses all the same same constituents as the best hand loaded ammunition and it's made there um at their facility in mesa under the same types of conditions that you or i would hand load ammunition under and you pay for that level of precision but um Sometimes, you know, if it's a rep from the company or um, one of their team shooters, they'll go ahead and enter a competition with that factory ammunition, and they can win with it. Right. But that's the rare exception. Everyone else pretty much hand loads. So are they using, like, a barrel tuner a lot to make it proper for their rifle? Yeah, and in fact, what I've done, even with some Vortex employees, is they'll want the best ammunition that they can buy without having to hand load. And I'll say, okay, go buy this this burger ammunition this factory ammunition give me your rifle i'm gonna pull the bullet out a little bit and then i'm gonna go ahead and seed it to a very specific seeding depth to tune it for your rifle and we'll we'll try you know do, we'll do a ladder test of five different seeding depths and i'll get it to where it will shoot the best possible out of that person's rifle i'll seat them all to that depth and that's what they want to hunt with um so wow do you use a kinetic puller for that or do you use uh no i use a collet style i need to get one of those <laughs> yeah yeah it doesn't deform the bullet um okay i don't like the it seems like a pretty violent thing and then yeah. the bullet comes flying out of there and maybe it twists the neck on the way out right and, yeah that's a, okay yeah cool all things that people like ian think about <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> um what uh all right so F are you class. are you are you Cheating off my notes here, Jim? I keep seeing the glance over. Well, I'm glancing over because, well, yeah, I want to make sure that, I don't know. I know that you get a little bit worked <laughs> it's up. It's group homework. You get a little worked <laughs> up when you have a list and we don't go off your list. I think, honestly, you like to make fun of my paper lists and when my printouts. And That's then not true. you because sometimes don't care we've for gone, the fact that you're finding it quite handy. <laughs> sometimes right we've gone in a way, I can't even read it from over here. You can, I, Sometimes we've gone in a way that doesn't go along with your piece of paper and then you get upset. So I'm just trying to Incorrect. avoid that. <laughs> um, is F-Class also, is it, it's not the same as, but it's very similar to bench rest shooting, right? And it's, bench rest is a type of competition too. Yeah, right? so bench rest, hence the name, is shot off a bench. So you yeah. got these guys sitting at usually a nice, heavy, concrete bench. But we should include it in the list because it is long range. So yeah. there's 600-yard mm-hmm. mm-hmm. and then there's 1,000-yard bench rest. And people have been doing it for a long, long time. Um, heavier rifles, uh, mechanically adjustable, uh, three-legged front rests, big rear bags. So it's kind of like... If you took an F open rifle and then brought it up to a bench and then changed the course of fire to be just shooting for a group or shooting for score, so trying to get that group centered on the target, but the target itself doesn't get pulled, marked, scored, and then put back up for successive shots, it's you're shooting blind. So basically, they've got a cider period and then a record period. So during the sighter period, it's much like F-Class where someone will pull the target and they'll mark it. Or if it's an electronic target, you can see where your impacts have landed. And then you sort of get empirical data about, okay, what's the wind doing down there? If I want to go for a score record, each target is scored for group and score. So you can win on group but lose on score, win on score but lose on group, or win both. So it's two different ways of measuring. But after the sighter period is over... You cross your fingers that the wind hasn't changed, or you're really good at reading wind, and you can and you know how it's changed. And the cider period, I mean, those are like they're just practice shots. There's practice shots. Yeah. Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. You want to get yourself centered up, and and sometimes people use the cider period to like 
test three different lots of ammo that <laughs> they're oh going to decide God. to shoot. <laughs> but then the guy says, okay, uh, your your time will will start when your target appears, and you shoot either five or ten for group and score. So there's five shot or ten shot. Um, the U.S. record was just set two weeks ago for ten shot heavy gun. So they have two different classes, light gun and heavy gun, but... Um, with one of our Vortex uh, Golden Eagle uh, optics, so that was really neat. But the guy Sweet. shot a 10-shot group at 1,000 with, I believe, a 6BRA, so a 6BR Ackley mm -hmm. approved, 40-degree shoulder. Put a little Ackley on it. Yep. I think he <laughs> shot, you know, the 105 grainish Vapor Trail bullets, but he shot it in uh, roughly two inches. I can't remember the exact number. It was maybe a little less than My two goodness. inches for 10 shots. So that's like... Bench rest is, I would say, someone's going to correct me here, but I would say 80% one, uh, you know, at the gunsmith shop and the loading bench, and then 20%, how well do you handle the rifle? How well can you get your shots off quickly? So when you see a, a bench rest match, when they say you can go for record, sometimes they'll be watching this infield full of flags, and the flags look semi-ridiculous they're like little windmills and colorful things fluttering here and there and you're like watching this field of flags and when they get the wind condition that they want boom 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 five and they're done oh wow yeah and some guys aren't even looking through the optic i mean they use it to get sighted in and everything but their rifle repeats so well returns to battery so well and they've got a little positive stop at the front of the forehand so they just slide it forward we're talking heavy guns that don't recoil very much but they'll just slide it back and forth and pull the trigger and they're not touching what? anything else on the rifle they're not shouldering it they're not gripping it they're not holding the forehand they're just basically sitting at this bench i don't mean to minimize it but it's it's part of the evolution of bench rest has become this free recoil style where they return it to battery and then just lightly touch a one ounce trigger and it all comes down to who can open their bolt put a new round in, close their bolt, and touch that trigger again quicker than anyone else, smoother than anyone else. So they get those five record rounds down in three seconds, something like that. Whoa. Yeah. I mean, That's like, crazy. in a way, you're like, oh, yeah, I don't want to, but, like, the amount of, like, work and effort and tweaking and precision right. and... I oh, mean, math. to be able to get to that point where you could even do that? That's insane. So it's like a competition in the true sense of the word, but it's a competition of different things yes. than what mm -hmm. we're talking about. My gosh. Yeah. And you know some you, you know that somebody out there just when they hear about that, they're just like, Oh my gosh, I want to figure out how to do that better and beat everybody else at it. Like that's just Yeah. Just how some people tick. But that's aw like that's crazy. I actually had no idea that that's how it worked. Yeah. Wow. I assumed looking through would be a key <laughs> component. Think, perhaps. So there's two two different styles. I described something that's called running. So that's shooting really fast and hoping that you get them down before something changes. Mm -hmm. The other is called picking. And that's sort of closer to F-class where they're literally reading the conditions and deciding exactly when they want to shoot each shot. And it takes them longer to get all, all the shots down, obviously. I think there are very, very few people that are good at that. Mm. So most people do the running. Okay. okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. There's just so many things at play yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. Now, a thousand yards, like you described a couple times, pretty far. Maybe depending on what you're shooting, it could be extremely far or long range. Um, there's my segue <laughs> into ELR. That was great, Jim. <laughs> so Thank smooth. You. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, like butter. <laughs> ELR is a, a form of competition that I've heard more and more about. It used to be just sort of like a weird thing that some strange people who had a lot of land talked about doing. But now it's, at least in my head, but now it's I hear it's something I hear a lot more about. Um, nobody agrees on what... It could be, ELR, it's extreme long range, right? Nobody agrees on what extreme is. In fact, people are nervous to even say. You're like, oh, well, what does it mean to you? And they're like, ah. Really yeah, like, I mean, you know, like somebody might, but um, I mean, there's why is that? 
is because it just varies so much depending on where you are and what it's what because you everybody even have not to everybody or, Jim but people you say if you say well oh, no this is E L R somebody goes, that's not E L R right then this you feel is E L R feel like a complete dweeb because then like, the oh, next oh, guy well. goes wait a minute no that's not E L R this is E L R <laughs> yeah I think it has to be. It's, I mean, it's definitely cartridge dependent too. I mean, ELR yeah. with my twenty two is a lot different that's than like, I mean, ELR with a three seven five shy tac. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so that's a, that's a big factor, and there actually is ELR twenty two competitions. I mean, me and Mike Tussler are going to be going to the King of point two eight miles here in I think it's <laughs> August. Um, that's and awesome. so that, that was, so that starts off as kind of like more of a PRS type shooting, okay. and then day two goes into an ELR match where we're actually going for the the ELR record for a twenty two. Sweet, yeah, well, that's awesome. So um, you are going for the record. Like yeah, I mean, anybody trying, there is going for the record. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But like Applied Ballistics is going to be there to do uh, um, people's PDMs for their 22s. I mean, PDM would be a uh, a personalized drag model. Yes. It's really getting into it. I mean, full on, full send. Um, but okay, so let's say you're talking about, I mean, a lot of people, they're thinking ELR, they're thinking big guns, right? Mm-hmm. They're thinking shy tax, they're thinking, you know, 4, 16, 4, who knows what. Giant. Uh, giant guns, thinking big rounds, big projectiles flying through the air, probably shooting. Okay, I'm just going to throw something out there. So somebody's going to, you know, you're shooting probably more than a mile, you know? Oh, yeah. Like, let's say that. I mean, 2,000, 3,000 yards, something in, in in that territory, just so far away. Well, the and then like of, that king of 0.28 spawned off of the king of two miles. Two miles, two miles right? yeah. Two Which miles. I think the closest target at that is 1,500. Is that right? When I did it, uh, the starter target was. Is either fifteen or sixteen? Yeah, yeah, that's where you started. And then the second the target starter. is two thousand, wasn't it? Yep. yep. Yeah. This is all like really exciting because if anybody's ever thinking, you know, I want to shoot long range, or thinking like, you know, oh, it'd be awesome to shoot at a mile or two miles or something like that. What is? Um, how do these competitions even actually work, though? How are you? How are you scored? If you got into this, what would the competition actually even look like? Am I? Are you just trying to hit a big giant piece of steel somewhere, or are you trying so, to score it, or what? I think Ian needs to speak to that because he's actually shot King of Two Miles. But I will say that there are definitely two different types of ELR competition. Like, I mean, there's there's that which yeah. is very long range, um, but then there's also like ELR matches where you know people take what is essentially their PRS rifle or just you know a long action and you know be shooting maybe 3000 yards and that's their absolute tops. Hmm. So uh, I just point that out cuz there are there are a couple of different ELR disciplines as well obviously so but of course. Uh, I think as a discipline it's probably the newest and less least structured. So one match is going to differ quite a bit. Um, from another one and there's some some movements to try and standardize in terms of okay well let's let's all vote on a target size that we can agree to and that way results from this event can be have meaningful comparisons to results mm-hmm. from that event oh yeah and that's you know there's been some headway there and and people are starting to and starting to kind of get on the same page there but there's still the just it's fun to see what you can do so there's this fringe that's like exposition shooting almost um let's get some people with some free time and some expendable income to take a bunch of shots at a really long distance film it and uh through the magic of editing we'll 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 show some impressive shots and they are impressive but it begs the question well how much skill how much luck how many shots did you take that sort of thing yeah right. yeah right so there's there's a community of of competitors that that want to make it um in their eyes, more fun because it's more structured and because, you know, there are yeah. sort of rules and, and, and limits to it. Yeah, when you watch it on YouTube, a lot of times you'll see something and it's like, oh, look at this shot at like 3,500 3, yards or something, and all you see is the impact shot, mm-hmm. and then everybody thinks like, man, it'd be so cool to be good enough where I could just like throw a rifle <laughs> on the ground and hit a target 3,500 yards away or something. But... They like said there's usually a lot more story there. Somebody shot a lot. Somebody. What they don't show you is probably a team of ten people all on radios that are like yeah. spot shotting and and relaying results back and yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's 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 an enterprise. Not only do you need the distance, but to do it safely, you know, you need a lot of forethought and and mm-hmm. and safety measures. Yeah, I mean, where do they even have these ranges? Where where do you go to one of these matches? There's not a whole lot of places. When I did it, it was held at the Whittington Center mm-hmm. in New Mexico, 
just uh, south of Raton there. Okay. And uh, it's a giant, um, I don't know, 400-acre complex or no, more than that, like four miles, score four square miles. But anyway, they have this little mountain range that serves as a backstop. So okay. once again, it takes a lot of time, but they spend two weeks hoofing it up there and lowering these steel plates by cables onto these rock faces so that when you miss – you get some sort of fiducial indicator of how far and where you missed. Oh, okay. Um, so there might be, you know, six to ten targets scattered across this mountain range. And usually they're, you know, steel, square, painted white. Um, but the thing, I think the thing that I I thought was maybe least fair about the whole deal was... You have a squatting time, you know, and it could be quite different from like the morning to the afternoon. And the way they have it set up, there's there's cameras on all these targets and um, one person shoots at a time. So it takes a long time to get through a fairly small number of competitors mm-hmm. for an event. Oh, yeah. uh, I think what would be cool is if they had opened it up to more people. So it's not just the same 30 guys showing up to all these events across the country. Open it up to more people and then say, well... Um, let's have them all on the line at the same time because we have these, you know, we were shooting off the 1,000-yard firing line at, at the Whittington Center. We were just shooting past the butts up into the mountain. Why not line up 100 guys or 50 guys or, or something and this have them shoot round robin, you know, shooter one shoots his shot, and you still only have the same number of targets, the same number of cameras. Mm-hmm. But I think that would be a little bit more more of a competition, mm-hmm. a true competition. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I do think that uh, that – particular genre of shooting needs a little bit more structure uh, because it is I, I think that's kind of almost I don't want to say that's the direction that a lot of long range shooting is going but it just inherently I mean we're a fairly competitive bunch we always want to push that boundary more and more and more and um, and and just being able to have it in a in a way that we could replicate like okay yeah I, I mean if you had a set target size that you had to hit yeah um and you can actually compare those results to somebody yeah. out east versus out west you know that type of thing so yeah i i think that i'm actually in the process of, of finishing up my first elr rifle i'm doing a 300 norma and um basically i'm building that rifle in i i wanted to be my like 2500 yard rifle mm-hmm. you know anything inside yeah. of there be pretty dead meat yep um I'm definitely haven't gone, you know, full shy tech or, you know, uh, but I would like to see a type of shooting that spawns off of that. That is a lot more structured. Yeah. yeah. Well, I that, think the community is getting there. Yeah. You know, these are all smart men and women who, who know what a fair competition looks like. So they're, they're evolving. Mm-hmm. Like when I did it, my, my little, little 338 AI was competing against the four sixteens and the, and the Barrett's and everything. Right. Well, now they have two classes. Right. Now it's like mm-hmm. okay, three thirty eight and below, three and then above. So they're well, they're getting there. It's tough because you always have to have, you always have to have a place for people to push the boundaries. Mm-hmm. And ELR, I feel like in a lot of ways, has tried to be a catch all. Mm-hmm. They're trying to make it a competition, which is difficult to have a competition unless you have some sort of consistency across the board for different competitions that occur. But if you then try and have some sort of consistency, like, say, a distance, which I know is probably partly the reason why everyone's so nervous to say what they think ELR is, because, you know, it's like depending on where you show up, it could be different. Um, But you have to have some consistency probably in distances and target sizes and all that stuff. But then once you add in consistency, it doesn't allow somebody to then just go crazy and really push it and do something more extreme, Uh, you know, like if the distance all of a sudden they were like, yeah, it's capped at... 3,000 yards is going to be like these targets, these targets, these targets, the size, that's what an EOR match is. Well, then if somebody builds a gun that can shoot out to 4,000 yards, like, where do I play now? Yep, right. Yep. And so then that, then all of a sudden, or well, is there like an EELR? And, <laughs> and then it just gets crazier right. and crazier. But um, what, uh, what optics are people using in ELR? I mean, thus far, we've talked about, uh, about sports in precision long range shooting that you can generally use uh, once we got to F class there's some specific stuff like the Golden Eagle is certainly a, a, a F class and bench rest specific rifle scope but otherwise the other stuff you could use a lot of regular optics in ELR I see people with Razor Gen 2s and stuff like that on their guns but I'm thinking to myself like how are you managing 
the amount of travel that you have to have inside the scope. Yeah. I mean, at some point, you just can't have enough travel or, or something. Like you're, yeah, I mean, are there canted rails that are like 400 MOA canted rails or something? Or yeah, yeah, there there are some rails that I mean, I I, I, haven't, I haven't been to one of these matches, but I've seen them on TV enough that you know I've people have their had their head basically this high above the stock to look down into their scope. Oh my gosh. Um, there's also rails, of course, rails and mounts that are adjustable. Yeah. Uh, which is, I think, I, I, like I don't know if you follow Jim C on on but Facebook, but he just did like thirty three hundred yards of the three hundred eight. Um, but he had geez. an adjustable rail on there because it would be literally impossible. But you you essentially have to have a scope. And by that, adjustable rail, it's actually physically taking the it's scope. actually adding cant to it. Yeah. Without okay, without the scope needing to do any of that internally. Yeah. 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 So the way I looked at it when I was picking out an optic was all right. What's what's the optic that has the most internal range of adjustment? And I'm lucky enough, you know, I had access to a Gen two, but I chose the Gen one because it had a little bit more internal elevation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you don't need tons of magnification. We're talking about you know three foot by three foot steel out there. So Gen one, and then it was okay. What adjustable bases are out on the market? None of them, like when you unlocked, adjust, and then relocked, you'd have unintentional lateral shift, and I okay. didn't want to have to deal with that. Unless it was like a one-time adjustment to try and max out and then lock it and forget about it. Um, so I ended up machining my own uh, rail that was like a minute and a half. Naturally. This so is another thing you I'm, should... I'm sorry. Uh, us. Yeah, it was it was a degree and a half, so degree ninety half. minutes. Yeah, this is another thing you should know if you're getting into like ELR and F class and all that stuff. I find even PRS too. The, the dudes who like do the best and really get into it and wind up also like just being super competitive. They probably also know how to machine stuff. Yeah. They probably also know how to like make stuff, use SolidWorks, and the oh, yeah. tinkerers. They, yeah, they tinker. Half yeah. anyway. of them are barreling their own rifles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, exactly. Yeah. Take, um, take those carry- skills, and then you also need a, a mountain range as a backstop. <laughs> yeah, and then good. buy a mountain range. A so co- anyway. A couple other tricks. If you specifically get a second focal plane, it sounds weird, but if you have holds in your reticle on a second focal plane, you can multiply the magnitude of those holds downrange by turning your power down. So you don't need a lot of power to make these shots. If you have a second focal plane that's optimized for 24, you turn it down to 12. Now that 15 minutes that you might have had below center is 30 minutes. So you can go ahead and hold 30 minutes low. So that's another trick. And then finally, as people kept pushing, they're like, okay, we need something else. Uh, What else do you got? And they started using periscopes, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah. So it's a prism that will bend the real image down range and give you a fixed b- boost of 200 minutes, you know, sometimes. Oh, yeah. I mean, the I remember seeing that one time on a gun, and dude, wacky looking. Yeah. But you could essentially flip something and you'd be looking at your normal image, then all of a sudden you flip it and you've literally, it, by one flip, you've dialed. Yeah, like yeah. 200 MOA or 300 and you, you, MOA or something. you left the ability to have a 100-yard zero way back there. Oh, yeah. What, like, what you, you might have a 1,000-yard zero. That's right. what I chose. Okay. Okay. Yeah. How can you even... What's... what's <laughs> how do you know if you're zeroed at 1,000? I mean, you, maybe, you probably have some little, like, you know, quarter size group to 1,000 yards, but... Is that what everybody's doing? How do they know that there's that there's zero? Just take an average of your group. Or yeah, something? you wait for like a windless day, and then you're like, okay, spin drift is this. All right, I'm zero. So you just wait for the right condition to get your zero. Wow. Um, Go out there when the sunlight's not very present, or like early in the morning, not enough what, mirage. <laughs> like, what What did right. your group look like with a, th- a thousand yard zero? Like what Like what was? Were you like ten inch? Group, twelve inch group. This one, group? this one was about five for five shots. Yeah, we're talking about Ian here. Well, no, right. not necessarily. the The rifle, the guy who built, uh, a friend of mine built the rifle, and it happens to be weirdly accurate um, or precise, I should say that that specific rifle. But um, so that helps, obviously, downrange when you're shooting at three thousand. You know, that's gonna that's gonna help. Um, what's weird is you can get really low SDs with these big cartridges too, because on a percentage basis. If you let's say you can throw a powder charge to plus or minus a couple kernels, um, that makes almost no difference with a giant case versus oh, a yeah. lot of difference with a small case. Sure. So you okay. get really really small SDs, so that really helps for ELR as well. Nice. But finally, so you've got this periscope, and now you might be looking right at the top of your barrel because literally your gun's pointed like this, and your scope's like 
yeah. intersecting, your line of sight is intersecting your barrel. So now what you see guys do is they add a second periscope to bend around the side of the barrel <laughs> <laughs> so that they can look around their barrel and, and, and see what they need to see. It's nuts. Wow. It's the Wild West. Unbelievable. Yeah. It, that's a, yeah, it's the Wild West of long-range shooting, um, still sort of like cutting its teeth, finding where it's going to settle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There it's, always, it has to exist. Like, there's things in life that just have to It wouldn't exist. be fun and otherwise. It, right. It, I mean, somebody's always going to ask the question, can you do more? Can you do more? I mean, once they figure out ELR, there's going to be, I guarantee it, there's going to be EELR. And then all of a sudden, there's going to be people trying to find areas in the world where they can shoot over the horizon and hit a target. They've got, you know, what I, I don't know. It's probably going to happen. Well, They'll that, have to go out to the ocean. Right. There's a match for you. Yeah. <laughs> Get targets out in the ocean. There's tons of space. Yeah. Why stay inside of the atmosphere? Like, the, the moon is already painted white, pretty yeah, much. That's a, that's yeah. a great point. <laughs> no primer necessary. Nope. That's a great. I tell you what, though. With Maybe Elon's, that's what all those divots Elon's are from. satellites up there, though, you're going to be, you're not only going to be waiting for the right wind gust, but you're going to be waiting for the right chain of satellites to not yeah. be in the way of, between you and the moon. Those those craters on the moon are actually just some other species ELR. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, that, uh, that plane's looking pretty shot up. We might want to stop <laughs> Um, all right. We've, we've kind of covered some of the, uh, I feel like some of the main ones that are in people's heads, maybe that they've, they've thought of or they've seen, or that kind of fit into what you might think if you're like, well, I want to take this a little bit further. What are, Mark on your, on your list, what are some of the other ones that I feel like are probably a bit more well, unique as we're checking things off here. So we've talked about a lot of different disciplines here and maybe some of them actually, we already talked about that fall within that quote NRA high power, but it sounds like when we were chatting previously, that's kind of like an all encompassing thing. And there's subsets within that. Yeah. Um, So high power, you could also like, let's say you wanted to focus on aperture sights, you could shoot, um, sling rifles or Palmer rifles, and that isn't supported by a bipod and a rear bag. You have other aids, you have a shooting jacket, you have a shooting glove, you have a pretty high tech sling, um, you have uh, a lens, believe it or not, that you can choose to either put in your rear aperture sight, your front globe sight, or you can actually attach it to like your head, like shooting glasses. So that magnifies your sight picture, but essentially you're shooting an aperture or iron sights at a target. Their target is roughly four times uh, on an area standard the size of the F-class target because it's, it's harder. You know, you're supporting that rifle. Oh, you yeah. have more wobble. Um so there's so there's sling, there's uh, service rifle. So you shoot what looks like a, an M16. Um, mm-hmm. And as of three years ago, they added optics to replicate the fact that you have a four power battle optic now, at least in this country. So you should be able to use a four power optic for for service rifle competition. So, um, for lack of a better term, that kind of seems like a moving target. Mm-hmm. You know what constitutes a service rifle? Like you said, they oh, uh-huh. a lot of guys are moving to optics. We got optics now, but even those optics, you know, you got one to tens now and yeah. things like that. Yeah, so. yeah, and and per the NRA rules, you can't use a one to ten set at four. Like literally, it can't be able to go past four. Right. right. Um, mm-hmm. So people use our like a one to four Gen one PST is a pretty common optic to use. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and then there's you know like um, small bore you do you can do uh, iron sight twenty two at uh, hundred yards as well, and I consider that long range, and so that's all within sort of the the small bore and high power NRA traditional style prone shooting. Um, one that's similar to small bore isn't on there. It's actually air guns at 100 yards right now are becoming real popular. Mm-hmm. Uh, they started out being real popular overseas. Uh, some heavy gun legislation type countries, um, but now they've come here. Oh, Mark had to prove that he. Did oh, did you have it on there? Yeah, he had. Oh, he, he had I to make sure corrected. we knew. No, you did your homework. <laughs> no, yeah, in case you didn't notice when he very, uh, very openly circled the air gun <laughs> in your direction. Well done. Yeah. So these are uh, pre-compressed uh, tanks um, in 25 caliber, 30 caliber, 22 caliber, shooting like little bullet shaped. I mean, they're not the pellets that we grew up with anymore. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty popular now and, and they do field, field versions where they're, you know, kind of in a field setting prone and, and things. And then they do, uh, sort of a bench rest version off a bench. It definitely seems like if you're into long range shooting, whatever, 
like firearm or air gun or configuration that you prefer, there's a segment of folks that will compete. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's yep. something for everybody. If it if it exists, somebody's probably made a competition around it. Like I, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if there's survival rifle competitions you know, or well, kind of are. Well, maybe <laughs> that'll, that'll get in my next one. Cause I yeah. don't think we did hit on those, Nick. And it sounds like that's something that you're kind of getting into as of yeah. late are those quotation mark sniper competitions, yep. which sound like they kind of bridge PRS with adventure racing ish. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a good way to describe it. Uh, there's, there's, there's a few of them in the U S um, vortex will be having their own, um, series of them next year which is pretty exciting in the 2022 season um there's so the vortex team sniper challenge there's mammoth sniper challenge which we are the co-title sponsor with grunt style and then there are some competition dynamics ones mm-hmm. um i think there's a few others but uh those are those are some of the bigger ones and uh what you're doing is you're taking a precision rifle and in the hardest divisions and all those you're also rucking so just to break down, like for the Vortex Team Sniper Challenge, you have um, you have all your gear in um, the LERP division. So that's the um, oh, I can't remember what you it stands the for. LERP? The LARP. 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 Yeah. LARP. Oh, so we're dressing up as well. <laughs> yeah, I like this. Oh, so lightning bolt. Getting, yeah. Lightning bolt. <laughs> <laughs> so in this division, what cartridge you are, are you running? Lightning bolt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Zeus painted down my rifle. <laughs> um, so what you're doing is uh, everything that you're going to be using for that weekend, which is a three-day long match, you have on you. So your ammunition, your rifle, all your clothing, all your food, um, your tent, your sleeping bag, wh- whatever you're going to have, except for with the, without, with the exception of water, they will provide you water because if you can, that would be 60 pounds of water by itself probably for the weekend. Mm. Um, but everything besides water you have to have with you. So um, over the course of four or three days, you're rucking, you'll probably put on about 40 miles total. I think that's what some of the guys said last year. They put on about 40. Um, you're rucking from stage to stage. So um, not as many stages throughout the weekend. You do, I think, um, five stages a day. And uh, in between each of those stages, you'll have a ruck that is somewhere between a half a mile and five miles. And, um, and so they're a lot more, I would say, problem solving uh, oriented. They have, um, you have to shoot pistol as well. So, and they're usually cool. team events. So there's the Vortex okay. Team Sniper Challenge team event. When you shoot pistol, is it because something jumps out at you in the woods while you're hiking? Or uh, they, Well, so they try to make them pretty interesting. Um, usually you'll start off a stage, if it's got pistol, usually you have some close-range targets that you and your partner both have to clear, get rid of the targets by you know, engaging them, hitting them twice, and then you move on to rifle. you got to locate the targets in the field, arrange them, gather your dope, communicate where the targets are, and engage those targets too. Mm-hmm. Oh, you have a partner too, so like mm-hmm. the whole time? Okay. Yeah. Did we mention Is it that? generally two man teams? Usually two man teams. Okay. Yeah. Um, and for at least like the Vortex Team Sniper Challenge, we like to use some uh, like historical engagements. So this year we did one um, from the Battle of Stalingrad uh, with Vasily Zaitsev and Major Koenig. So as you, you're essentially Vasily in this particular situation where um, you go, get up to your stage, they brief you, okay, there is a sniper downrange, we do not know where he is, um, and you got to survey the field to find the sniper's hide, you engage the target in the hide, and then you engage a couple other targets in the field. Uh, so at that one, it was really cool. We had a, um, a former sniper actually build the hide and then he put a humanoid silhouette target inside of it and then they also put a flasher inside there so periodically there'd be a flash from inside this hide to to represent muzzle flash so yeah lots of stuff like that i think uh last year um oh they did a car rollover simulator so you and your partner are both buckled in seat belts and then they they literally roll the car and then while you're upside down you draw your pistols you engage your targets upside down and then you know ditch your pistol in the proper safety bucket and then you climb out of the vehicle and then you and go engage your rifle stuff did you get like world strongman out there to roll the car or do they just have like a forklift no it's actually like uh what they use for training 
um, for police and uh, law enforcement and military. Oh. Is it is it on like a like a gimbal so it can? Yeah. Okay. I thought so, you were rolling it down. A no, it's not a literal I know, I car. No. Like, it's okay, a, you guys ready in there? <laughs> it's a rollover simulator. Okay, but yeah, you're okay. in seats. You're you're strapped in, and then they roll. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some guy just rolling a car down the hill. Good luck, buddy. Bring it yeah. back up. Yeah. yeah right, now push yeah. it back up. Oh, Boy, they're shoot. really uh, they're really going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, it was a lot bigger than we thought. Oops. Uh, oh. Next year we're gonna have to find a smaller hill. Yeah. Um, so wow. that they're they're interesting. It's um, they usually happen on military bases, right? Oh, not always. Not uh, always. They're like so, Mammoth. Uh, that's on Fort Gordon. That's okay. been there for the last three years now. I think it'll be there this year as well. Yeah. Um, Vortex Team Sniper Challenge uh, last year. It was at uh, Coleman's Creek, and then I believe we're gonna do either four or five matches next year total. Nice. So one at Coleman Creek, and then. And then uh, we'll have a finale at the end. What about, so you're talking about problem solving. Is that happening just with the um, the stage, if you will? Or are there things that you're doing before you get there? Are you doing like land nav type things where you have to learn kind of those skills outside of shooting? Uh, the land nav thing isn't necessarily um, a big one because usually you're rucking with a big group and then they have like the trails marked out. But something that you do have to consider is that you do have a par time for the the distance and um so like uh mammoth is a 16 minute mile pace so if you do not arrive at your destination within a 16 minute mile pace then you're done shooting Hmm. oh interesting so what so it's not like okay let's say jim and i are team you guys are team is, is it like a is it a pass fail or if like we go faster we get extra points? It's a pass fail. Um, a lo- sometimes what they'll do is they'll if you finish the ruck first, then you get to pick where you are in the shooting order. But that's really the only perk you get. Okay. Some guys will literally finish last. In fact, I think uh, uh, Jim C and Isaiah Curtis were intentionally gaming that one a little bit at Mammoth last year, as they were intentionally finishing last because then they would have to shoot first because nobody wanted to shoot first. Well, they were like, well, I get up there and I got a clean target. Because they're going oh. and repainting all the targets at Mammoth, uh, at Vortex we don't paint the targets. Um, they're hard, they're hard to find for a reason. So we, they they leave them uh, either paint them gray, Yeesh. or they just leave them steel. Hmm. How about that? That is tricky. Yeah. Hmm. So it makes them a little bit more difficult. Um, we also don't do a 16 minute mile, so it's a little bit. Uh, the pace is opened up to an 18 minute mile, but um, they actually had to extend one of the rucks last year because the terrain is so bad that it was impossible to get an 18 minute mile even. Oh, oh. got it. Okay. Cool. Interesting. Oh, uh, yeah. That sounds pretty extreme in all yeah. kinds of different levels. Yeah. So somebody likes um, backpack hunting, for instance. Uh, I got a couple of friends that do pretty extreme backpack hunts that are going to be coming out and doing those matches this year because nice. of the fact that. I mean, it's right up their alley. They have a, a usually a lighter weight rifle. Some guys are a little bit ballsy and they carry their full, you know, twenty-two pound PRS rig with them, oh, wow. which I, I think is insane. That's yeah. a, I, that was going to be my next question because you're always telling me to add more weight, add more weight, <laughs> and I was going to ask you what your rifle's looking like for these sorts yeah. of things. So my rifle uh, weighs in um, at fourteen pounds two ounces. That's incredibly light for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's carbon fiber. That's barrel. Nick really trying. Yeah, that, that was me really trying. But I'd have let you borrow my gun. <laughs> <laughs> well, your gun and my gun probably your gun probably weighs just a touch more than mine. Yeah, everybody likes hiking five miles and then getting punched in the shoulder repeatedly. I was talking about the 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 PRS gun. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. my bad. I thought you were talking about the old three hundred. So no. I'll be shooting a six arc though. Um, oh, so newer Hornady cartridge. Um, it's a really small case, six millimeter bullet. Lighter ammo. Um, the ammo is lighter. The recoil is lighter. So the I don't need a heavier weight gun. I should still be able to watch my splash. Um, yeah, it's kind of it's a purpose built rifle. For now I'm game. surprised that in a sniper comp they don't make you shoot 308. Um, a lot of guys will shoot 308, and so actually in if if for being a team match, one guy has to be either 223 or 308. Oh. The other guy can have whatever he wants. Mm. Got it. So I got, uh, so I got a Bighorn TL3 action, um, and then I ordered two barrels from Proof, one in six arc and one in two two three. So depending on who I partner with, my partner says, "Well, I want to be open to vision. I got this 300 norm I want to shoot. Okay, well I'm going to take the two two three. Then I'll just unscrew that barrel, screw the other barrel on. Okay, and, and vice versa. Okay, so nice. two teammates can't share uh, each other's rifles. They have to. You have to shoot the one you're carrying. Um. I don't think necessarily. Okay. So you could theoretically like share each other's guns. Yeah. 
Okay, so you could both shoot the same rifle for the whole competition. One guy could just carry a, a one-pound plastic gun, save himself some weight. I suppose probably. No, I'm gaming. Uh, you I was game, say you're but you would, but you, most of the time you shoot at the same time. Oh, so gotcha. you would never oh. be able to get enough hits. Yep. That'd be a problem. I would think it could be an advantage to shoot. Like, let's say if some somebody has to be a 308, then just both guys shoot a 308 because then you could use each other's wind calls mm. and stuff like that. Yeah, that's that's actually a strategy. So some of the guys down in product development are going to be shooting them next year, and uh, I think all of them are shooting 308 for that reason. So okay. they're all shooting the same ammunition, basically the same rifle. Um, so they all qualify for secondary shooter. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just going to simplify things across yeah. the board. Yeah, it does make it a little easier. Hmm. What about... Very interesting. I, I've just All these questions, Jim. Now I'm really going down the list. We're oh, talking. Are you we're, moving on to another one? Well, wait, were you not? What do you got? I don't have another one. Well, I'm then out. I'm going to move on. <laughs> are there more? All right. Well, are I've, there more? I've got, I've got a couple more. And, and again, this kind of goes back Let's, to if there's some... If Let's, you're into we're at it, almost an hour and a half. Let's I know, quick list. This them. is really good. L- uh, long range single shot pistol. Oh, that oh, is yeah. that we is a, that's that. an outlier. That's um, I think it started out sort of in that varmint hunting. Like, well, if we can do this with a rifle, maybe we can do it with a <laughs> with a pistol. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then, of course, what's it gets a little bit blurry. What's the difference between a rifle and a pistol? Because a lot of these specialty pistols, they are built off of bolt action. Quite rifle-like. Right? Yes. They've got a barrel. I think the shortest one I've ever seen is maybe 10 inches. I've seen some of them are, you know, 22 inches. But there's mid-grip, um, sort of like the old XP 100s. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got a transfer bar to the action that's back here. Uh, there's rear grip. Um, so it's basically, it looks like a little rifle, but you've cut the buttstock off right at the pistol grip, usually shot off of a bipod. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes they even have like a, a, like a sort of a, a, uh, palm swell at the bottom that rests nicely on like a sandbag. Okay. Um, So it's very supported. Um, and people started to say, well, these things are surprisingly accurate. In fact, Hey, my pistol shoots better than my buddy's rifle. This is pretty neat. Well, maybe we'll have a competition surrounding that. I think it spawned out of the Western States, Wyoming, Montana, that area. And I think they still hold competitions. They're, um, they're like handgun single shot pistol association, something like that. And Mm -hmm. they hold competitions usually shooting like, um, uh, steel silhouettes, so mm-hmm. silhouettes of groundhogs and, and mm-hmm. things like that. But very neat. I've got a couple of them uh, from um, a related discipline that was called uh, International Handgun Metallic Silhouette, and that was real popular in the 70s. And if you've ever seen a vintage photo of uh, a guy laying down but recumbent, not head first, he's laying down with his head back here, and he's got his foot stretched out, and he's got his pistol like rested on his boot. That's yes, like called I have the, actually have you? seen that. Yeah, that's called the uh, some sort of weird uh, Creedmoor position or something like that. And they're iron sights, single shot, bolt action pistols, and um, shooting at silhouettes. Um, that was real popular back in the mid '70s to early '80s. Um, but I just I got them as sort of a well, this would be a neat backpacking rifle. Oh. So to speak, you know. Sure. Three oh eight. One of them's in seven mm oh eight. Paul Neese might like that for oh, his yeah. backpack hunts. But uh but yeah, it could be super compact and suppressed if you wanted it to be. And um so kind of a kind of an oddity, but it's it's like answering the question, well, how accurate can a handgun be? Mm-hmm. And that's where they ended up. Well, if you just make it like a rifle, then <laughs> Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> definitely yep. unique. We want to see how accurate we can get with a pistol, but that's really hard. So why don't we start incorporating a lot of rifle stuff yep. into it? It is probably pretty important to to uh, clarify too that these are like the bolt actions. They are pistol mm-hmm. actions. So like, don't take your Remington 700 and cut the stock off. <laughs> right. Yeah. Once it's a oh, rifle, yeah. it can't become a pistol. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Easily good, anyway. Very good distinction there. Yes, uh, Nick. Thank yeah. you for that. Good call. Um, are there any? Are <laughs> Okay, we're talking a little bit about like international competitions. Like, what, like, are there PRS matches internationally? Is that is that a U.S. thing or like, are there? If a person was so inclined to want to choose a discipline, are there ones that you could kind of select from that are more, I guess, worldwide versus 
regional. Like if you're like, I want to do competition shooting, and I want to potentially also go internationally to do it too. Yeah, there's quite a few. Um, so PRS um, or that shooting discipline in general is exists in many countries. I know we have some guys down South Africa that do, um, and then there's in the UK, in Ireland, in uh, Australia. It's pretty big. So yeah, that's that's definitely mm-hmm. um, international. Um, is I it think. the same style, or they also call it PRS? Um, so it depends. So some like there's PRS Australia, then there's NRL South Africa. Okay. Like so, it's it's all okay. the same style. Um, what they call it might be different. Yeah. But as far as bigger ones, I, I think it's probably more popular in the F class areas and stuff, right? Yeah. Benchrest has a world championship, I believe. And it might be every four years. Uh, F class has a world championship. Uh, training for that right now as part of the U.S. team will be in South Africa in 2023, Bloemfontein, South Africa. It got pushed back two years uh, from COVID. Um, the last world championship was two. 2017 in uh, Connaught, uh, Canada. So it kind of goes to a different host country every four years. Mm -hmm. And then there's a selection process with every team's uh, national team that that gets down selected. Um, And then they travel and it's, it's pretty, it's pretty fun. Nice. That's awesome. I like it. Well, Mark, We've exhausted the list, Jim. We've exhausted and, our and the list. listeners. We've exhausted, yes. Uh, if we missed any, though, we'd love for people to comment about that. Uh, the other thing is, Mark, I feel like we should reveal that uh, we are going to do one of these for the first time ever. And we picked we picked the one that's probably, arguably, the most popular, uh, I'd say, in the United States currently. Or at least it, it, it seems to have the biggest groundswell uh, among it right now. It's got some is, zip. It's got some zip, which is... Uh, Action, the action shooting element of long range precision. Uh, we're going to shoot a PRS match. Yeah. Yep. And uh, we'll see how that goes. Really? You're going to shoot center fire or rim fire? Uh, good question. We're going to shoot center fire. Yeah. Okay. So it'll be actually at a Vortex title match, the Vortex Vengeance match. Oh, nice. In Pennsylvania. That'll be fun. Indeed. Um, so, yes, uh, hopefully we don't make tremendous fools of ourselves <laughs> the other thing is you know if this goes well mark uh we at least know of like eight or ten others that we're gonna have to also try i'm sure exactly point. it seems like with a lot of this stuff you know even when we're talking about like oh yeah you can do the nrl stuff and just whatever old 22 like that's fine like you can start with that but if you start to like it you better buckle up because <laughs> you won't have that old 22 for much longer <laughs> All right, yeah, exactly. Or um, center fire or whatever. Right, right. So, without further ado, that's what's up next. But, uh, yeah, we appreciate everybody for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. You. Bye. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below, and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.